Welcome to First Jefferson Unitarian Universalist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We are still closed for in-person services due to the escalating number of cases in Fort Worth and Arlington. We pre-record these services and stream them on Facebook each Sunday morning, and later they're available for you on YouTube and on our website, firstjefferson.org. If you would like to be placed on our mailing list to get the news of all the events provided online, contact the office at administrator at firstjefferson.org and provide them your mail address, your email address. You can also go to our website for information about the church and to no donate to our programs. On this lovely autumn morning, let us begin our worship with music. Come out of the dark earth, here where the minerals glow in their stone cells, deeper than seed or birth. Come into the pure air above all heaviness of storm and cloud, to this light-possessed atmosphere. Come into, out of, under the earth, the wave, the air. Love, touch us everywhere with primeval candor. I love that last line of that poem by May Sarton. Love, touch us everywhere with primeval candor. Love is probably the most powerful tool in the human resource first aid kit. The line made me think immediately of the lovely hymn, Love Makes a Bridge, number 325 in your hymnal, or see the words on the screen. We have two song leaders this morning, Della Purden and Rosalind Hunter. Please join them in singing. Thank you, ladies, and thank you, Amisha, for the pi lovely piano playing. Please join me in lighting our chalice this morning. We gather this hour as people of faith with joys 
and gifts, joys and sorrows, gifts and need. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning in the celebration of life that we share together. And now join me in saying our covenant as we do each Sunday. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is our sacrament and service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve others in community to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with creation. Thus do we covenant with one another. Each Sunday morning as I start my responses, I present a couple of questions to the listening congregation. And these are my questions for this morning. At the congregational meeting in May 2018, this church voted to change its name. However, the topic was tabled and a committee appointed for further study because there had been no decision as to what the new name might be. And there was a question about costs and being able to afford to mount a change. The topic will come up again at the congregational meeting on November 8th. And the service today titled Reinventing Ourselves asks two questions. Who are we and who might we become? Not surprisingly, the questions can be asked both of individuals and religious communities. And my responses this morning will reflect both entities. But first, a story for all ages. Actually, we're going to have two stories this morning, two singers, two stories. We are in worship heaven. The first story, um, I don't remember the name of the person telling the story, but it will show on screen, and then I'll come back and tell you about the second story. My name is Shamile Sayed Mendez, and I'm the author of Where Are You From? Illustrated by Jamie Kim. I would love to read it to you today. Are you ready? Here we go. Where are you from? Where are you from? They ask. Is your mom from here? Is your dad from there? They ask. I ask Abuelo because he knows everything. Unlike me, he looks like he doesn't belong. Where am I from? Abuelo thinks. His eyes squint, like he's looking inside his heart for an answer. You come from the Pampas, the open free land, he says. You are from the Gaucho, brave and strong from the brown river that cleanses and feeds the land that gives us the grain for our bread, the milk from our cows. You're from mountains so high they tickle Senor Cielo's belly, where the condor roosts his family and the jaguar prowls the night. But you're also from the warm blue oceans the copper warriors tried to tame, and the elegant palm trees stretch their fingers to caress. You're from hurricanes and dark storms, and a tiny singing frog that calls the people, the island people home when the sun goes to sleep. From this land, where our, sense, where our ancestors built a home for all, even when they were in chains because of the color of their skin. You're from the grandmothers who search for their grandchildren, waiting, always waiting in a plaza, their white handkerchiefs wrapping the sorrow of their thoughts. You come from the sunshine that lights, lights our path in this world, and the rain that washes away our mistakes. But Abuelo, I ask, where am I really from? Abuelo laughs. You want a place? 
he points to his heart. You are from here, from my love and the love of all those before us. From those who dreamed of you because of a song sung under the Southern Cross, or the words in a book written under the light of the North Star. You, you're from all of us. I am. The end. Thank you for watching and remember, you're from here. That story asks, who am I because of where I come from? And grandfather says, you come from the heart. It also asks who I might become now that I'm somewhere else. Our second story told by our religious exploration educator also asks these two questions, but be they asks them because of what I'm named and what my name might be. Thomas? Good morning, everyone. Today I'll be reading you Fragments and Front Porches. It's from uh, UUA.org, part of our Tapestry of Faith collection. The story is by Reverend Elizabeth Nguyen, who is of Vietnamese heritage, and this is a personal story about herself. Reverend Nguyen is a former UUA staffer, a commissioned community minister, and she now works as the immigration bond coordinator with the National Bail Fund Network. Each of us has a heritage from a different country, maybe two, unless we were born Native American. Some of us the difference between this country and the country our grandparents or parents came from is hardly noticeable. But for others, it sets us apart. Still, each of us carries many stories of our ancestors, and we carry them forward through our own lives. Reverend Nguyen writes, When I was 24, my father gave me a new name. I was learning Vietnamese in graduate school, and the professor required all students who only had an English name to ask their parents to give them a Vietnamese name. My father chose Hain, meaning gentle. As a teenager, I had yearned to have a Vietnamese name. All of my cousins had one. To me, not having a Vietnamese name was just another way that I was not whole, not authentically Asian, not Vietnamese enough, not worthy of my own family. I was, in theologian Rita Nakashima Brock's words, restless in longing to belong. Years later, when my father named me as Hein, I didn't feel the simple relief of belonging that I had so craved. Instead, I found something more sacred, something expansive, fierce, complex, and true. I was born Elizabeth, and I am also Hein. I'm white and of color, American and Vietnamese. Anti-oppression and anti-racism work for me has always begun with my own identity. It has been the work to excavate my mind from the silt of internalized racism and the oppression of dominant culture. It has also begun with my own spirit, embracing both my yearning for wholeness and my love of this fragmented, multiple identity. In my Unitarian Universalist community faith, I find companions, theology, and rituals that honor the fragments of my identities, my haves, my multi, my hyphenation, my two names. This work is not just about courageously loving myself. It's also about courageously loving my Unitarian Universalist Ken, as we try to live the beloved community of Dr. King's dream. It's about talking with white people about racism, about supporting people of color, Latino and Latina, and multiracial within Unitarian Universalism, without isms and power and answering the call of love. It's about having hard conversations with ministers who understand race very differently than I do, creating worship that is multicultural and alive, that resists tokenism and essentializing. It's about shifting resources and facilitating workshops, 
about sharing experiences of racism and asking questions, about embracing conflict with song and prayer. It's about encountering my own limits as an ally and an anti-racist person of faith, about messing up and failing, and about asking forgiveness and beginning again in love. And it is about celebration and moments of connection across great difference. Buddhist writer Jack Kornfield writes that in meditation, instead of clinging to an inflated superhuman view of perfection, we learn to allow ourselves the space of kindness. There's a beauty in the ordinary. We invite the heart to sit on the front porch and experience from a place of rest, the inevitable comings and goings of emotions and events the struggles and successes of the world. I love this image for thinking not just about meditation, but also for talking about race across difference. When I'm in conversation with someone who I think is very different from me, I try to let go of perfection and find that space of kindness. I invite my heart out onto the front porch. So with that, I ask you to ask your parents and grandparents about the parts of your history you don't know. Not just the kids, the adults too, if you're able. It's a way of finding out who you really are and of deciding who you want to become. It's a way of letting go of perfection and finding that space of kindness that invites other people into your circle of friendship and love. It is my understanding that if you as an individual want to change your name, you can do so at any time as long as it isn't for the purpose of cheating someone or doing something illegal. Nicknames are one common way of changing your name. A man can be named William at birth and be called Bill the rest of his life. A woman named Elizabeth can choose to be Liz, Betty, Beth, or any number of derivations. Some people choose to be called by their middle names instead of their first names, perhaps because someone else in the family uses that name or they don't like their first name as well. In this country, it is common for women to change their last names when they get married. When I got married, I didn't know this wasn't required. I thought it was the law. It was so common, everyone did it without question. And later on, some women began to insist on their own identities. And for a while, there were lots of women who kept their birth names. I remember when I was married, I took my wedding license to the Bureau of Motor Vehicles to get my driver's license changed. They didn't even look at the document. They just said, congratulations, and gave me a new license. But when the marriage was dissolved and I returned to the DMV, I was told they wouldn't change my driver's license without a separate court order unless a re um, for a return to my birth name was part, unless the return to my birth name was part of the divorce. Does a name matter that much? I think it often does. It is the beginning of your identity. It is the way people relate to you or the way you relate to yourself. My given name was a compound name, my middle name a long name, and my family name multisyllabic. And for a shy child, this was a burden. My second grade teacher, for some reason, insisted we introduce ourselves by all three of our names. Eight syllables. And by the time I got to the last syllable, most new people didn't remember the first one. My mother discouraged nicknames, and most of my friends didn't use my name. They just said, hey or started talking to me. I never really felt my name belonged to me. But when my grandson was born and he called me Annie, I knew I had discovered my true appellation. I immediately went to court and had it changed legally once and for all. Now the L that precedes my true name on legal documents is a nod to the given name I had been identified with for 43 years, but seldom use. Once a friend excited to get my attention called out, Annie, Annie, look at this. 
She spoke my name twice in contrast to the near silence of my name throughout the early part of my life. It made a great deal of difference to me. I felt more accepted for myself. My given name had been a mask. But Annie made me feel free of pretense. Each of us has a story about our names. I often use the question as an icebreaker at meetings when people don't know each other well. Our names have histories, stories, significance for most of us. That goes for organizations as well. First Jefferson, for instance, didn't get its name because it was located at the corner of First Street and Jefferson Avenue, as one new member surmised. It was originally the first Unitarian Church in Fort Worth and took the name First Unitarian Church. Later, a group of members who shared a different set of values and a different approach to worshiping separated from the original group and formed their own church. They chose the new name Jefferson Unitarian Church because they were admirers of Thomas Jefferson, framer of the Declaration of Independence, third president of the United States, and one of the country's founding fathers. Later still, when the two congregations rejoined, they chose a name that would include both churches' histories. First Jefferson Unitarian Universalist Church. Now the name Universalist had been added in 1961 when the two denominations merged. A lot of syllables in this name as well, but they hold 70 some years of history. In 2017, a small group of people who were beginning to work on anti-oppression and anti-racist multicultural issues suggested that Thomas Jefferson did not deserve our admiration for the fact that he did not free his slaves. Others suggested that given the culture and the financial situation he found himself in after the presidency, when early presidents spend much of their own money on the office, he would have been unable to do so and financially support those slaves and his own family. That is how the matter of changing the name of the church came to on the, be on the ballot in May of 1918. In that meeting, there was some discussion about what the name might be changed to and what it would cost to make such a change, both in time and money. An ad hoc committee was appointed for further study, and the issue was tabled. A change in board leadership, the emergence of the pandemic, and the schedule of other issues in the church have pushed the name change to the back burner until now. There is still no official proposal for a new name, and the ad hoc committee has reported there will be costs associated with a name change, mostly administrative, which we would probably have to hire a temporary person to oversee or pay overtime to our current staff. These are the business issues that will be discussed at the meeting in November. In the meantime, the identity issues reside in all our hearts and need to be discussed on the front porch. Who are we? Right now, we are an amalgam of our diverse histories, the identification of our various members through memory and involvement, and we have yet to begin the conversation of who we might become and what that will mean to us and future generations. Shakespeare thought to ask, what's in a name? And the question has resonated down through the generations. While we think about this, let's take a moment for our generosity report. One of the responses to who are we is we are a generous, caring, and compassionate group of religious liberals who continue to support the church and the programs it offers through pledges and gifts of money and donations of time and talent. Don't be fooled by this video of our weekly service into thinking there are only three people involved, me, a singer or two, and a piano player four if you count the storyteller who recorded the story previously at home. It requires time and knowledge to get the picture and the sound just right for recording, to see that the words to the chalice lighting covenant and hymns are available to put on the screen, and to save the recordings after they're made. 
The generosity of these people stems from their desire to have this beloved community intact when we return to in-person services. We offer our gratitude for their generosity. My reading this morning comes from a historic document, the Joint Merger Commission Information Manual, and it was a 1958 report by Dan McCannon. He wrote in part, the process of consolidating the Universalist Church of America and the American Unitarian Association began in earnest with the creation of a joint merger commission in 1956. This reading is from an interim report of that commission in 1958, and the merger was not completed until 1961. And the largest question in the whole process was, who shall we become? Why is all of the president, present attention being paid to merger? The first and basic why has already become clear. It is no accident that for 100 years, various rapprochements between the two denominations have been made. There is an affinity between them of which there is a growing awareness. The differences which separate them become of decreasing importance. The likenesses of point of view, purpose, organization, and operation increase in significance. He wrote, the mer word merger does not have the same meaning for everyone. To some, it means a form of federal union of the two denominations. To others, it means a complete functional merger resulting in a new denomination. To still others, it means the continuance of one of the denominations with the other dropping all of its denominational apparatus and its churches simply becoming members of the continuing denomination. The recommendations of the Joint Interim Commission, which were approved by the Unitarian General Conference in August 1955, included the following. We conceive merger to mean the establishment of one corporation which will perform for Universalists and Unitarians all the functions now performed for them by the Universalist Church of America and the American Unitarian Association. The report went on to list advantages and disadvantages to merger. At one point, the topic of what to call this new denomination was considered, and the commission at that time advised the participants thusly. Both names, Unitarian and Universalist, have sectarian connotations largely in doctrinal terms. Therefore, it would be an advantage if some name could be devised for a new denomination, which would more nearly indicate the real meaning of liberal religion. But in the end, it was determined that the historic meaning of each denomination was more indicative of what the new denomination might become and on which it could be built. And both names were adopted as the name of the new denomination. Because of this, all of us were encouraged to learn and to understand the strength each organization brought to its new family. All learned to appreciate the inheritance that was passed down to future generations. This was a historic moment in history, and it deserves our memory. But in the meantime, um, this reading has made me think of the words of Edwin Markham's memorable poem. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took him in. Please join us in singing the song, Break Not the Circle.
Thank you. Every Sunday we talk about the communion of names and milestones, the stories of joy and sorrow that live in this community that are shared with one another from time to time and kept alive in our hearts. We're happy to report that Patrick Gutierrez is back at work this week. Uh, we talked about him last week. And this week I have another note from Jude Olson who asks again to keep her brother Daniel, her twin brother Daniel, in our prayers. She said that he suffered a stroke in Philadelphia five weeks ago and he has entered a rehab and is undergoing several kinds of therapy. So we are keeping hope alive for Daniel. Let us take a moment to consider the stories told and untold that live in this community. Let us take a moment to share a silence of remembering, of love, and of hope. Let us continue our meditation as we listen to a musical response. Who might we become? It took six years for the merger of Universalists and Unitarians to be completed. Actually, it took 106 years because that conversation had been started long before it was actually taken seriously. And with all the concern about legal, financial, and social issues, one of the biggest points of discussion was what shall we be called? The discussions continued long after the vote for merger was taken. Many churches did not change their name for decades to include the other denomination. The principles and purposes which were promised within three years of the merger took 24 years to accomplish and weren't made part of the bylaws until 1985. Now these seven principles of values and six sources of inspiration seem as if they've always existed because they were worth waiting for. And people have gotten used to being a two-name denomination. The long discussions were worth the time put into them. I have recently talked with a pastor of a Unitarian Universalist congregation that decided to change their name. They have been in the process for four years, believing it is important that everyone agree on the purpose for the change and the new name itself. 
they had given themselves a budget of $12,000. And this, they said, their fourth and final year of discussion, they have nearly spent it all. This year, their discussion centers on the topics, how will we rebrand ourselves? How will we know ourselves? And how will others know us? They realize in their in-house discussions of what's in a name that their name has had a large part in their personal identities, but it has also played a role in how other people in the area see them. Their four-year discussions, he told me, gave them new insight into what they wanted to do locally and nationally as a church and as part of the denomination. Their original name had been geographical, pinpointing the place where their meeting house was located on the map. They thought it made them insular. It made them think small and ungenerously. They wanted to be a church involved not only in the community, but in the world. They wanted to stand for peace and for justice, for equity. They have not yet chosen their final name. Who might they become? Their minister told me they are excited about the answer. This minister from his South Carolina congregation spoke with such pride when he talked about how early disagreements had dissolved in patience, understanding, and love. How new insights had developed. How hard the congregation was willing to work to answer this question. And I thought it was important to share this story with you because it is similar to our own questions. So who might we become? We have lots of choices, both for naming ourselves and choosing our future direction. We could drop one name, one part of our history, as some suggest, but it would still be in our history nonetheless. We would just not think of it, or we would pretend it didn't happen. What would we learn from doing that? Or we could make peace with that history and vow to do better, to learn from and take pride in it. We could claim we were the first in this area and we vow not to repeat the mistakes of our heroes who turned out to have clay feet. Or we could totally rename ourselves, choosing our location so people would know where we are. Sandy Lane Unitarian Universalist Church has been suggested. But what if we were to move? We could choose a value, Serenity Unitarian Universalist Church or Tranquility UU Church for those who are seeking a spiritual home. What about choosing one of the values we share in our publication banners, Hope Unitarian Universalist Church or Community Unitarian Universalist Church, no, already used by the church in Plano, or the Unitarian Universalist Church of Awe and Love. One of the common UU names used throughout the country is All Souls. How about All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church of Fort Worth? Now, I'm not proposing any of these. I'm just starting the brainstorming session. Who might we become? What is our emphasis, our reason for being? Are we a peace and justice church? Are we covenant? Covenanting to destroy the institutions of white supremacy? Is our role to improve our neighborhood, our state, our country, ourselves? Is it to support other local nonprofits that provide food, clothing, and shelter to people without? I'm not surprised it has taken us so long to come back to this conversation. We need to be asking the question anyway, whether or not it has anything to do with our name. Who might we become? When our doors open again, it will be a brand new world, and we will be asked that question even if we ask it of ourselves. Do you want to be part of the answer? I'd like to hear from you. So would your board of trustees. Join us next Tuesday evening for our weekly talk back or write to me at minister at firstjefferson.org or to the board of trustees at board of trustees for at firstjefferson.org. I'm looking forward to the conversations we will have at our virtual congregational meeting on October 8th. In the meantime, here's one answer to the question. Who 
are we? It's our closing hymn number 1051. We are. And I hope you can figure out how to press your repeat button and listen again and again. I'm going to extinguish our chalice now as it is served as a beacon of our community, of our hope, our dreams, our conversations, and our incessant questions. We take it into our hearts and minds so that it always lives. Theodore Parker said, the R's a religion which like sunshine goes everywhere. Its temple, all space. Its shrine, the good heart. Its creed, all truth. Its ritual, works of love. Its profession of faith, divine living. So may it be in all our lives. <laughs>